There we go. Good morning, everybody. It is, wow, Friday, September 25th, 2020. Still living in COVID times in the United States and abroad. So things are still a little bit unusual, but here at the HCMA, we've taken the opportunity to go viral or virtual, hopefully viral someday, uh, virtual on a lot of different topics, including our HCMA Tales from the Heart podcast. So you're going to be watching live on Facebook today as we record our podcast, and then it will be available for upload next week from wherever you get your your podcasts, uh, including the HCMA website, our Facebook and social media platforms, um, iTunes, um, Podbean, or wherever you get your your uh, your podcasts. So. Um, today, we are going to be talking to Dr. Harry Lever from the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, we're going to talk about generic drugs. We're going to do a little history on that. And we're also going to talk a little bit about your general questions on HCM. But before I invite Dr. Lever to start participating in our conference today or call today, um, I want to let you know about a couple of projects that are coming up. And I'm going to be posting a link to our Facebook page uh, where you can click the link to join in what I'm going to tell you about today. Um, so I made the unofficial announcement yesterday in the private group on Facebook, and today I'm inviting everybody to learn about this and participate. We are beginning a new project, and it is called Share Your Story. And as part of Share Your Story, we are going to be videotaping individuals who have um, HCM, and we're going to talk to you about your individual experiences with every aspect of HCM diagnostics, symptoms, um, treatments that you've undergone, lifestyle issues, emotional issues, and they're going to be turned into educational components of our brand new website, which will be coming out in 2021. What we're hoping to do is share a diverse amount of stories from everybody in the HCM community that represents all genders, all uh, races, religions, uh, points in the country, points in the world, we want the whole story of HCM to be told through the voices of the people who know it best, you the patients. So we're going to be recording over the next three weeks. There's going to be some slots available to share your story. You will have to have an updated file with the HCMA within the past two years. If you don't have that, call now and schedule an intake and we'll get you on the schedule for share your story. But we need to kind of know how to tell the narrative so we can put all the pieces of the puzzle together. So we need to just call in and we can prepare that. So you're going to get a link on Facebook um, during this presentation and after it. So you can take the survey and let us know when you're available and we'll have a conversation about your HCM. So without further ado, um, I welcome again to our Facebook page and a longtime friend and uh, colleague, friend, supporter, uh, battle, uh, partner in crime, uh, Dr. Harry Lever from the Cleveland Clinic, who's going to talk to us today a little bit. I've asked him to talk about the history of generic drugs so we understand what we're talking about better and how to take care of yourself. Good morning, Harry. Hi. How are you today? Good. Okay. So can you tell us when generic drugs hit the market and kind of what the lay of the land was at that time? And how things have changed? Well, uh, 1984, there was a law passed in Congress, uh, the Hatch-Waxman Act, and what basically they were trying to get drugs on the market cheaper, so that they felt that if if a drug had been uh, had been uh, name brand and uh, they they didn't have to be thoroughly studied like it like it was uh, when the drug first appeared. So there was called it was called an abbreviated drug application where they would only have to study about 25 normal volunteers to make sure that the blood levels were okay and that uh, what they what they did was they said that the blood level had to fall between 80 and 125 percent of the blood level of the uh, name brand drug and uh, that, that if if you had that that was enough to get the drug on the market. Uh, the problem was that for some drugs, it's a little wide. Some drugs have what we call narrow toxic to therapeutic ratios. That means that uh, uh, you, you have to have the, the blood level has to be closer to the, the name brand drug, but that, at least that's what they started with. And for the most part, things were running reasonably well. The drugs were being made in this country. And then uh, people began to realize that um, 
they could make them overseas even cheaper. And that's where we started running into some difficulties, uh, particularly um, uh, um, when they were coming, now they're coming from India and China. And that's, that's cause they're not all bad, but some of them don't work very well. And that's been a major, major uh, problem. And uh, I got interested in this problem uh, on May the 25th of 2007, I was driving to work and listening to NPR and there was a program on, um, it was about food and drugs coming from China. And at that time, I didn't have a clue that that was going on. And, and uh, it was rather shocking when I listened to the program and uh, realized that uh, there were problems with this stuff coming from, uh, from China. And I started doing Google searches uh, drugs China and found that there were indeed a lot of lot of drugs and one of them was heparin, the blood thinner that we use in the hospital for heart, heart surgery and for people that have blood clots and stuff like that. And uh, we had realized that uh, uh, there were people that were having, we were, we were noticing in the hospital, some people were having some difficulty with heparin their platelet count would fall, which does happen at sometimes. It just can be an immunologic reaction. But, but we, I, I called our pharmacy when I saw that heparin was coming from China. I said, where are we getting our heparin from? And they said, oh, it's Baxter, a good American drug company. I said, are you sure? And they said, yeah. Well, uh, it happened that uh, it, indeed what had happened, Baxter had gone to a a company in Wisconsin and they were a venture capital firm to have the drug made. So they thought they could have it done cheaper. Well, this firm unbeknownst to Baxter went to China to have it made. And they, um, uh, at that time there was a shortage of, uh, of pigs in, in China. And that's where the heparin, heparin comes from the small intestine of a pig. And so they, um, they were, the, the, there was a disease in the pigs and uh, the Chinese realized they didn't have enough. And they found this strange anticoagulant that they mixed with the heparin called super sulfated chondroitin sulfate because they had found in a, an article in it that was tested in test tubes that it seemed to thin the blood. Well, the problem was they uh, didn't know that it would cause a severe allergic reaction. And subsequently, uh, um, it was, there, there was a, actually what had happened was there was a, a, a nephrologist in, uh, uh, in, uh, St. Louis who, uh, actually I think she was an infectious disease doctor who had four kids who were on dialysis and they, they suddenly uh, got sick and she reported it to the FDA and the FDA took it to the CDC and long story short, they found this chemical in there and it took them about five months to find it. And it turned out that a hundred people died from this heifer. So that, that raised a lot of concerns. And, but, but that's sort of how I got interested in it. And then I started looking at uh, other drugs that, were, that I found on the internet that were being made overseas. And some of them caused, I found in my practice were causing trouble. One of them in particular was metoprolol succinate, which is we use for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients. And uh, I was starting to see people coming in and they uh, suddenly weren't doing well. And that's, that's how I got really started with it. So let's talk about name brand drugs versus generic. In the law that was passed in the 80s, there were parameters that were given for how equal these drugs needed to be. Right. They were never viewed to ever be 100% equivalent. Right. Can you tell us what those percentages are and why that's uh, that was That was eight, between 80 and 125% of the blood level of the name brand. And uh, the, mm -hmm. one of the problems was that um, the generic drug companies were never given the exact formula for the, uh, for the, the name brand drug. And they sort of had to come up with their own formulas. And the, one of the problems was in the inactive ingredients actually that were mixed with the active ingredient. And the problem is that if the, the inactive ingredients are the things that cause it to be absorbed or not be absorbed. 
And that's, that's, that's where some of the problems, they, so they would tend to come up with their own formulas for that. And, um, and you know, it, uh, one of the problems we started seeing was maybe batch to batch variation. You know, it wasn't each batch that they would make wasn't quite the same. And that's, that's, uh, that's a whole other issue. But so, and it, you know, it, it matters how diligent the company was. And uh, the other problem was that in this country, the FDA routinely would go in and inspect pl plant every two years unannounced. Well, when they would go in overseas, they might give them three months notice. And so if they had a problem in the plant, they'd clean it up before the FDA got there. And that, that was a problem also and continues to be. So I wanna take a deeper dive into, you know, what's happened since the Generic Drug Act kind of passed um, in, in the 80s, allowing them to be put to market. This 80 to 120 or 125 percent of the actual name brand drug was in a time where we didn't really have time release medications. There right. were no long actings. So right. can you explain how sensitive these time release molecules are in the Well, that, that was one of the problems is that the generic drug, uh, they would not be given the formula for them to make the, to know how to make it for sustained release. It wasn't quite as critical if you were taking a short-term drug that would say be there for four to six hours. But when you were taking something that was supposed to be there for almost 24 hours, it had to be made, you know, uh, in, in the right way. But that formula did not have to be released to the generic drug companies. And so uh, with metoprolol succinate, for instance, uh, um, they, uh, it, it was, it's a very complicated formula to make uh, to cause it to release slowly. And actually they're, they're little pebble, pe pebbles in the tablets and then they have a special covering on them. And then the tablet itself has a special covering so that it would be released in a slow, steady way. And uh, that, um, that, that's where some of the problems have occurred mainly where they're we're dealing with long acting drugs. Although there's, you know, some, some of these shorter acting drugs also have problems if they're not made in the way they should be. And uh, one of the things that we have found is that the conditions in some of these plants overseas are not good. They're not clean. They're not, uh, you know, not kept the way they should be. And, uh, and so uh, they, that's, that's the problem. And then when the FDA can't get in there, on a surprise visit, that's a that's a big problem. And right now, with this um, COVID business, there are no inspections going on overseas because they didn't want to expose the invest the in inspectors to go into these places. So that's another problem. So right now, we have no eyes on the ground, nobody watching the production of medication that will be given to millions upon millions. Of Americans and others, that's right. Nobody's really watching. That's right. So that's not good. Nope. <laughs> that's not good. So we know the history. We know that some people are known to have died from poor quality drugs, and we know. You know, I shared my story recently um, about my anti-rejection medication. They changed my manufacturer and told me it was an equivalent. And because I know to look for such things, um, after three weeks on the med, I went and got my blood levels tested and found out that I was below therapeutic level and I was at risk for rejecting my organ, my heart. And I changed my dosing and I got everything back in line and my I went back into therapeutic range. So um, variability from manufacturer to manufacturer can be real. You metabolize one thing and not another or vice versa. Um, you have quality issues that are still out there that we don't have a lot of control over right now in the world. Um, and not to get political, but why are we offloading our manufacturing of something as important as our medications 
to places that we don't have eyes on the ground to make sure of the quality. So I think this is a major, major issue that people don't know about. And I think they should get a little bit more engaged in understanding where their drugs come from, how that process works, what the supply chain looks like, and how much control we actually have over it and don't. So tell me about some of the experiences that you've had, specifically with patients with HCM, who something didn't seem right, and you said, let's look at the meds. Well, What's so happened there? What happened was, um, it was about, uh, I started noticing maybe in 2010 that, that uh, uh, people would start coming into my office and they would see, uh, I'd see them and they weren't feeling well. Their heart rate wasn't under control. Blood pressure wasn't control. Maybe they're having more shortness of breath and um, uh, chest pain. And uh, there was one company that actually was made in this country. It was called Ethics and uh, was was the company making metoprolol succinate when I had never heard of them before. And uh, we, uh, um, I, pharmacist gave me the package insert, got a hold of the package insert for the drug. And it said on there that it does not meet USP specifications for dissolution. It was right on the package insert. I couldn't believe it. So, I talked to talked to the pharmacist, and we decided we. I, I made one phone call to the FDA, spoke to somebody in the cardiorenal division, and they couldn't really tell me much about it. And then they suggested I talk to somebody in the generic drug division, and then at that point, I got the pharmacist in my office, and so I'd have a witness when we talked to these people, and I wasn't get. I, they really wouldn't give me very good answers. I mean, and it was really hard to know what was going on, and so. Uh, I was very dissatisfied with that. It turned out that this company was a subsidiary of another company called KB Pharmaceuticals in St. Louis. And um, I started watching the internet. You know, I became really an internet watcher of drugs. And uh, this company, uh, Ethics, was making other drugs, propafenone, digoxin, um, they were like the digoxin was propafenone and digoxin were coming out of the pill making machine double strength instead of like 200 milligrams it was 400 milligrams for the propafenone the digoxin instead of 0.25 was 0.5 milligrams well eventually the fda realized there was a problem with this company and they were put out of business but that was an american generic drug company and then so when they disappeared there wasn't, we were back to the name brand drug. And then I started again, seeing another situation. And this one was with a company called Walkart from uh, India. They had 26% uh, of the market. It turned out they snuck in there. We didn't know about it. And, uh, but again, I started seeing problems in which time I wrote a letter to the FDA in December of 2012 and uh, this was, again, this, this was sustained release, metoprolol succinate. I got an email back from the individual at the uh, FDA within three hours saying they would look into the problem and get back to me. Well, it took them 18, actually it was about 16 months to write me a letter to tell me that there was no problem when I knew that there was. But then most recently, the, the situation became more clarified. It was, I mean, I didn't know all the details at the time, but there's a book that has come out. It's called Bottle of Lies. And we interviewed Catherine Eban right here right, earlier right, this year. Right, right. And in that book, uh, it he, she talks about a, an investigator for the FDA by the name of Peter Baker. And I've subsequently had an opportunity to speak to him a couple of times. And turns out that he went into that plant, that Indian plant, seven months after I wrote my letter. And of course, we didn't know that at the time. And he found all kinds of problems. And the uh, place was dirty. Uh, there was mold and mildew. And there was you know, rust on the machines and all this kind of stuff. And he reported it to the, to the uh, headquarters. And they kind of blew him off. Well. And I, but of course, we didn't know that at the time. And we didn't know about that until the book came out. But about 
um, my about for I don't know 14 months or so or maybe 16 months after the my letter went out I had been in touch with the New York Times and the New York Times reporter calls me this one day and she says you know that drug you were worried about it's been pulled from the market I said what are you talking about she said yeah it um, didn't pass dissolution tests and they pulled it from the market so at that I you know, I felt quite vindicated at that point. And it, and it just, you know, it was, you know, we don't know to this day why the FDA didn't really want to take the drug from the market, but subsequently it was taken. And so, uh, but we continue to have problems. And uh, there is uh, one brand, uh, Dr. Reddy, that's particularly a bad one. And unfortunately it's still being sold in metoprolol succinate by Dr. Reddy. It's still being sold in this country. And I don't know why. Last year in 2019, the, they had the, Dr. Reddy had five separate recalls of all different kinds of drugs. And in spite of that, the FDA still allows them to sell drugs, including tacrolimus for her for uh, you know, preventing rejection of hearts. And you know, we just have to be vigilant. And what I tell my patients is that if you're on a drug and you're stable, you don't let the pharmacy change the manufacturer on you. And sometimes that's hard to do because the pharmacy says, well, that's all our wholesale, wholesaler will, will uh, uh, give me. And uh, I've had some patients that, you know, we've had to change pharmacies. We, you know, do whatever we can to get them the right stuff. And, and again, it's not that the generic drugs are bad, but if you're on one and it, you suddenly see that you're not feeling better, don't always assume you're getting worse. It may be the fact that the drug isn't controlling your blood pressure or your heart rate or something like that. The other, the other problem that we've had is there's um, uh, there's a drug uh, these are angiotensin receptor blockers uh, one, of the, one of the more common ones is losartan and another one valsartan uh, that uh, was on patent uh, until 2011 the Chinese realized they could make it cheaper and they started making it but they changed the formulation of how they were doing it and in so doing they introduced a carcinogen into the drug. And they, um, uh, I don't know that they even realized what they had done, but the Germans found, this was in 2011 and 20, oh, 2018, the German equivalent of the FDA found the problem. And we all started, we were getting, it, you know, it wasn't easy how we, we were just sort of hap by happenstance heard about this. And it turned out that after I looked eventually 1159 lots of the, the, of the different ones in, on the, of the angiotensin receptor blockers were removed from the market because of the carcinogen. And so, you know, it, it, that, that again is a problem. And uh, that's, that's, a whole, that's a whole other deal. But it, 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 so you have to be very careful when you're on, when you're on uh, uh, a medicine and you seem to be doing all right and suddenly you're not. You've got to be aware. One of the things that I've, uh, told patients, and it's a, it's, a, um, it's a website that I have found. It's called drugs.com. Um, I don't know if we can, if we can try to bring it up, we can, do you want to do I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up. I'll bring it up and we can, we can do a search or two. So keep talking. I'll get it there. Yeah. So what I've told people to do is you have to identify your tablets and basically every tablet has a number and a color and a shape. So you put that into the, into the program and then it'll tell you who the manufacturer is. So then once you know the manufacturer, start Googling them and see if they've had any recalls or see what kind of problems they've had. And I'm always suspect when I see something coming from India. And, you know, it's, it's, getting, it's much harder now because a lot of drugs are coming from there. One of the things that I have done is I try to still use an American manufacturer, even though it may be made in India, with the hope that they're inspecting it. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Unfortunately, recently, Myelin was cited by the. Oh, we're losing you there, Harry. You got a little, you have a little hiccup. We have a little hiccup in the, in the audio. Go back to Myelin. Myelin is a, Myelin is a American drug company, but they've got some plants in India. 
And they were recently cited by the FDA for having some plants in India that were not clean. And that was unfortunate. And, uh, but they claim that they're, they've got things corrected. But, you know, it you know, turns out no drug company is perfect, but uh, they're less perfect overseas. And uh, so. so I have drugs.com up and I know that there. You see a pill, I, pill identifier. I was gonna say, what did they call that? Because I, pill I identifier. Feel it. It's an Can option. Can you show it on the screen or? Oh, there it is. Hold on. Um, so let me. Show it to me. I will see it. Or I can show it. Well, they get, they get to see all of us on this one because I'm not working on my other computer. Right. Um, so, right, so there's pill identifier. Yeah. So you got pill you identifier hit, right here. You hit that. You and accept it. Accept. And then you, you can use this one. Just use the one that's there. 935510. Oh, wait. Let's see. 935510. Okay. And then it, and say it's round. And let's see if it comes, it probably will come uh, beige. beige. Yeah, let's see what that says. All right, now scroll down, hit view images and details. That's Mercat, mm -hmm. it is Mercaptor Purine. Now scroll down there. Mm -hmm. And it's made by Teva, which is an Israeli drug company. And then you can look up people, you can do right. your research on who your manufacturer is. Right. And where do people find the name of their manufacturer if they have a pill bottle? Uh, well, <laughs> That's not always easy. Some pharmacies put it on there and some pharmacies don't. Uh, I've, um, Walgreens and CVS and Rite Aid are pretty consistently doing that. Uh, Walmart on the other hand, doesn't always. They might put the number on the, on the label but they're not really telling you who the manufacturer is. So uh, I've told my patients, I tend to stay away from them but um, uh, and so then what you do is once you know who the manufacturer is, you look them up and you see what kind of violations they may have had. And particularly if there've been violations of the drug that you're taking. And do you have a list that you might want to talk to us yeah, about? Yeah, I have. A, there's a, I, let me, let me get my slides here. And we'll show everybody a couple of ways that they can keep an eye on their, uh, uh, before I forget, let's go back here for a second. That was the program that I listened to, and it's still available on NPR if you want to listen to it. Which one? Which one is that? As, in, as imports increase, a tense dependence on China. May the twenty okay. fifth of twenty oh seven. Thank you. Okay, and then let's go through here. See, this was found in an Indian plant, a monkey. I don't have your screen yet. Oh, okay. You don't have my screen. No, you got to share your screen. I thought I did. I'm sorry. Wait, That's okay. I'm sorry. Let me go back. I, think it, I didn't hear right. Hold on a second. Let's go back here. Yeah, here we go. So everybody can tell I hadn't had my second cup of coffee yet this morning, so I'm enjoying it with you all. Okay, let's see if that works. Please never tell me there's a problem with caffeine. I'd be really sad. Okay. So we, we, there was an entire slide presentation that you can go slide by slide there, that Dr. That? Lever, yeah, that? it's a monkey. Monkey. Isn't that cute? And then we've got birds. Is it, well, let, let me, let's give this context. These are pictures that were taken in a manufacturing plant in, in India. India. Yeah. Um, and these, there's a full presentation that Dr. Lever right. gave previously right. on this page so you can go see right. the entire right. talk. Here's another, this is Dr. Reddy. Bugs a bug. All right, so let's go ahead here. Now. A little extra protein. Yeah, a little extra protein. Right, this is a snake. That's how they were, that's dealing with the small intestine of a pig in China. That looks very sterile. Ext extracting the, extracting the, uh, how, the how health. many health violations can we find in one picture? I can like do like 40 of them there. All right, let's go ahead here now. Hold on. Anybody wanting to see this entire talk, just go into the video library and you'll see Dr. Lever and I speaking um, this spring and doing this uh, entire presentation. As of right now, I think most of you have probably watched it because it had 15,000 views. So thank you for watching. Okay. I wanted to kind of focus on specific drugs and manufacturers and a little history today to do kind of a recap. So you know, here, again, version. here again is, uh, 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 this is off of drugs.com, torsamide. You know. I've had both of those. I've had both of those shapes of tourist of mind in my day. 
So here are the ones that I, that I don't ordinarily like. And this one, Glenmark, is very interesting. I knew about them in 2010. There was a patient came into my office on nitroglycerin. Somehow she got the Glenmark brand and it didn't work. And so I've known about that one. And interestingly now, this company, Glenmark, is the only one making Verapamil, the extended release Verapamil that is used by Hocum patients. And it's the only, so I've tended to switch my patients from, from Verapamil to Diltiazem. But these are the, but these, this, these are the companies that I have a problem with. So let, let's talk about this for a second. So somebody comes to you with HCM symptoms that all of a sudden aren't stable anymore. And you look at the pill bottle and you see that it's a manufacturer that has been known to have quality issues in the past. And you give them a new prescription of either a different generic or a name brand drug. And their symptoms did what? Some of them, if they get better, then we just watch them. But if they, and I tell them, I said, this is not, may not be your problem. But, but as I, I say, there are two unknowns. You, the patient are one unknown and the, uh, the drug is an unknown. And it'd be nice if we only had one unknown, that means you. But so we, the first step we try is if you suddenly are feeling worse, we see what the manufacturer is. And if it's a bad one, we switch it. And if you get better, fine. If you don't, then we know we've got to certainly go further. Uh, but um, this Dr. Reddy is really a very bad one. And you got it, and it, if you get that, you tell the pharmacy you don't want that one. So sadly, the manufacturer of my tacrolimus that I seem to metabolize well is actually on this list. Um, and it is... Um, with the sender accord now no accord is my pharmacy ascend is the actual brand right and that's the one that works for me but it, I, it's variable so you have to go for blood level checks all the time to make sure you stay at therapeutic doses um and then you think about the burden to the healthcare system that why am i having to have all this extra blood work because i am i'm stable now i i know where my my sweet spot is for my drug level and and at least tacrolimus is a leveling drug where I can check my levels in my, with a blood test. Um, you can't really do that with metropolol. You can't do that with verapamil. You can't check the level. You have to hope that the patient's feeling well enough and that it's dealing with the symptoms and it's not too much and it's not too little. So I think this is a really great list. So for those who are watching on a phone and it's little, um, so we have Accord, Amneal, Apoctec, Ascend. Apotex, Apotex. Ap Apotex, sorry. And what's, in it, what's this one? Aerobindo? Aerobindo. Camber. Camber, Camber is the one that, that is a repackager that sells torsamide or Demodex. And that's a, that's a real problem. I've had lots of troubles with that one. You want to go through the rest of the list? And Caraco was actually, uh, they were, they're an Indian company, but they had a subsidiary in this country. And a number of years ago, they were raided by the FDA, FDA or, the, or the FBI, I can't remember, but they, were, they really had some bad problems in Detroit. Ugh. And, and the, the others were, uh, Lupin is one that I don't particularly like. Ranbaxy is an interesting story, and that is a lot, of, a lot about Ranbaxy in that book, Bottle of Lies. And uh, they, they were selling expired drugs. They were selling, they, when they would supposedly test their drugs, they would go out and buy name brand drugs and test them saying that it was their stuff. And I actually was a whistleblower against them who I, who and I, I've become very good friends with. And he, he uh, th they were fined $500 million because they cheated so badly. And they, they uh, were eventually put out of business. Although now I've seen some of their stuff back, but I, I may, it may be another, you know, I'm, they may use the name, but I don't think it's exactly the same Rambaxi, but, and Walkhart was that, one that had the, the metoprolol succinate that I wrote the FDA about. Solco is a Chinese company that I've had all kinds of troubles with. And then on the next slide, let's see here. Hey, what's the definition of insanity? This I pulled out of an article, not by the FDA for the fifth time this year. That was in an article. And that was just within the past year. Yeah, and this these ones are pretty good. Lynette, Lynette is the one that makes the metoprolol succinate. It's an authorized generic. That means it's exactly, exactly the same formula 
as as the name brand drug. So let's let's talk about that for a second. What is what does that definition mean? An authorized. It means, it means that it's sold as a generic, but it's exactly the same drug, and they just lower the price. How do you find they, out where those drugs are? What's an exact and what's a true? Well, I mean, I, I've just kind of come to know them. I mean, it's it's. <laughs> It's hard to, you know, but I, I, that's the thing I Google. I Google them and they'll tell you that. Okay. Presco is a company that sells drugs generically. They relabel them with their name, but they're really authorized generics. They're the, the same stuff. One of the ones they use the, the uh, albuterol for the inhaler. It's exactly the same stuff as, uh, as what's made, the name brand, but they just sell it cheaper. They choose to do that. And Interestingly, one of the drugs I had a problem with is from a manufacturer on this list. <laughs> and it was Sandoz, Sandoz version of Tacrolimus. Mm. I thought it was manufactured in the United States or in Europe. It right. is not. Right. It is off overseas uh, in India, I believe. Um, and uh, when I called to report the problem to the company, it was, it was impossible to get anybody to take your call. Um, I still have to write it up for the FDA and provide my my blood test. But then here's an interesting one. So the company asks me, the patient, to share all of my medical information with them so they can be sure that my problem didn't occur outside. I have no idea where they get the audacity to ask me to completely release my medical records to them so that they can do an analysis of what happened to me without including me in the outcome. I'm like, well, what's, what's going to happen with this information? Are you going to report it back to me? Are you going to talk to me? No, 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 no. We just want, we need all of this so that we can prove that it really was a problem. And I laughed and I said, no, thank you. I'll deal directly with the FDA. Yeah. Scary. Now, there's another thing we need to talk about. Let me go back a few slides here. Um, hold on a second. Okay. There's, there's a problem with metformin for diabetes. Uh, and these, these companies have had stuff recalled. The problem is uh, the metformin, it, w when it's made by some companies, and we don't know exactly why this has happened, uh, about half, half of the metformin now that's been produced has this N NDMA in it, which is a carcinogen. And it's really caused... Uh, something. Hold on. <laughs> I'll be right back. Oh, that's funny. Harry will be back momentarily. Hello. So as you can yes. see, this metformin has become quite an issue. And I'm going to Yeah, I'm on a I'm on a Zoom call right now. Can I call you back, please? Can I <laughs> I'm going to mute him. Sorry about that. We'll edit that out of the podcast. Um, so as he was saying, this metformin problem kind of flew under the radar. There are many, many millions of Americans taking metformin. And through the craziness of the pandemic, the information regarding this toxicity didn't make front page news. If this had been another year, I think this would have been a much larger story on a national level. Um, so there are a lot of people who are either having a hard time. Oh, hold on, Harry, I put you on mute. You're back now. I was explaining the the history of the metformin problem. Yeah, it it it's really uh, you know about half of it that's out there has been shown to be carcinogenic. And on the next slide are the ones that have we know of that have a problem and they've been recalled. Now this brings up another issue. Uh, there is a pharmacy in New Haven, Connecticut called Valisher. They are they test drugs. They test. They were the ones that found the metformin problem. There's also a problem with Zantac, uh, which is a drug which, off. Which, been, which has been removed from the market completely because it's carcinogenic also contains this NDMA also, but it seems as though that's the result of the way the drug is metabolized. It's unstable when it gets into the stomach and forms this NDMA. So that all of that's been removed from the market. And if you need something like that, drug. We now use Pepsin. And as far as we know, that one does not have the problem. Uh, but uh, we don't... Can you spell the name of that pharmacy? Uh, Valisher, V-A-L-I-S-U-R-E. And they're and in New Haven, Connecticut? New Haven, Connecticut. 
so they test metformin. They've test they 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 were early into the angiotensin receptor blockers that had the carcinogen from China in it. Um, and they so they're a pharmacy who brings in batches of drugs, does batch testing of the right. of the product that they bring in, and then they dispense to the public. That's right. Okay. Right. And, and they do mail order and they cross yeah, state lines. They, 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 yeah, only 28 states right now. I don't have the full list of them, but I. Uh, I actually, yeah, but I, I can. I, That's I, okay. I, we can post it for them later. There are 20, 28 states that they sell the drugs. And, and, and I've had to go to some extremes for some patients if they weren't licensed in that state, but the patient had a relative living in a state that was licensed, then we'd send the drug there and then they. The family would mail it to the patient, but, oh boy. Uh, but but it's you know, and we hope over time that there are going to be more drugs tested, you know, in different all you know different um, you know there'll be more testing laboratories. We hope because that's what really needs to happen. You need to be testing the drug uh, before the patients swallow it because what, per uh, what percent of drugs transported into the United States? are inspected when they come into the country for quality and 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 equivalency standards? That is a hard question to answer. I don't know for certain. What is the estimate? I don't know for sure. The pro problem is there are, there are some regulations uh, that the FDA has, but it's hard to get, it's hard to find out exactly what's really going on. It is just not it, it's not, it, it, one of the problems also has been uh, with this problem with the mail right now. Uh, if a drug gets delayed and it's sitting out in the heat somewhere, it may get uh, damaged. And if you look at bottles of pills that you get, uh, it'll, particularly if you get a stock bottle, it'll tell you that the temperature should be maintained between a certain you know, certainly not above 85 degrees or something like that. So that's, that's another whole issue is how we transport our drugs. And all this stuff has not been as well worked out as it should. And certainly with this, with this business, with our illustrious post office, uh, that's a, that's another major problem. Yeah. And um, not only do you have to worry about the temperature and the timing, you also have to, you know, just worry about the reliability of it actually getting there on the timeliness, I should say, right, is, right. you know, if, if we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, if you're, you know, within a week or so of running out, don't wait till that point to reorder. And a lot of drug companies or pharmacies um, associated with insurance companies specifically are aware of this problem and they will let you go a little bit early on your refills right. these days. Um, and through the pandemic, they've been actually pretty good about making sure people don't run out and, and trying to be as limiting on the, the systems of essential uh, services as possible by um, allowing you to do extra months, et cetera. So ask when you're refilling if you can get an extension on that. All right, why don't we, um, let, let's go to some Q&As. So I'm gonna have you stop sharing the screen and then I'm gonna try to find my, uh, my Facebook page again. And I'm gonna, that participant sharing. And I'm going to go back to the Facebook page. Um, I'm not particularly thrilled uh, from a logistics point of view on how the Zoom meeting flies into Facebook because number one, there's a delay and number two, it's really hard to get your questions and answers this way. So um, I'm going to say right now you can start your questions. Um, I do have a couple here. Um, Tom, I will post the list of manufacturers. I'll have Dr. Lever send me the PowerPoint again with the list of metformin uh, manufacturers that have recalls associated with them. And um, what about Unichem, U-N-I-C-H-E-M for bisoprolol succinate? Are you familiar with that manufacturer? Unichem? Unicam, yeah. I can, I can look them up, but I, I don't know that. I, I so it's not a known problem no, at, no, at this time. I don't know of just, let me just quickly, let me just see who I'm, I'm not sure I can do it here while I'm on. No, I, we'd have to look that one up. I don't know. It's so weird. Well, let me no, roll through you. all of your I questions. Lost you. I lost you. I'm right here. I'm still here. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm on the screen. You just lost the screen. Yeah, let me see here. Okay, so I actually have to go to my Facebook page, people. I'm sorry about this um, um, technical difficulty. I have to turn off my volume and then I have to take my questions from my phone. 
but I'm glad to have the technology. Okay, okay. Um, we answered that one. Is there anything that we as HCM folks can do? Well, yes, there is. Um, and thank you, Diane, for that question. Number one, document, document, document. If you notice that you are having symptoms and you suspect that it might be related to a change in your manufacturer, and the best way to think about this is if there's a symptom that you haven't felt in a while because your meds have been covering it or you haven't ever experienced before and you're on a medication and you've gotten a new bottle and something changes like in, in a few days of you taking the new pills, it's not necessarily gonna happen on the first dose, but if you notice like a week later that something's just not right, talk to your doctor, document the event, maybe try a different manufacturer. And if it is found to be connected with that batch, it has to be reported to the FDA. There is a page on their website, I will go get it and send it over on this page, that you can report an adverse event. And an adverse event is, my symptoms came back with this manufacturer, this batch, this dose on this day. And the more you document it, I know it's a pain in the neck and it's just, takes you a lot of time to go to the site, fill out the form, give them all the information, but that's how you document the problem. So we, we have two options here, folks. We can be, as my husband loves to say, problem identifiers or problem solvers. We know where the problem is and we can harp on about it, but how do we solve the problem? We communicate. We go to the FDA and say, we wanna help. We wanna help find the solution. We don't wanna call you the bad guy. We know you have regulatory language that you're held to, and there are logistical issues that you're held to, and there are cultural differences between how different countries manage corporations, and there are different ethics that are involved depending upon who the players are. We are the voice of the patient. We are the people who are on the front line of using these drugs, and we need to make sure they're the highest quality possible. So we have to work together with everybody, manufacturers, physicians, pharmacists, regulators, members of the FDA, member, uh, members of the drug design teams for new companies. We just need to make sure what we're getting is reproducible and it's not toxic. It doesn't have side effects that are going to be worse than the disease itself. So yes, data, 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 data. Okay, Coumadin is one that I cannot take the generic of and they, and they aren't manufacturing name brand. I think I'm in trouble. Um, okay, so well, there's, an, there's an advantage to Coumadin. You can get your blood tested. Yeah. And, and, and I think that, you know, if, if one manufacturer is not working right, then try another one. And I think it's, I think name brand Coumadin is actually still being made. I, I, I don't believe that. I think it's, it is still around. One of the other things that we found about Coumadin is you can get a device and test the blood at home, particularly now with this Mm -hmm. Iris, so you don't have to go to the hospital or laboratory to get it done. And then what you do is you, you got a prescription from your physician. They, 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 the company can give you training over the phone and then you prick your finger and once a week or whatever, you call your doctor and tell him what the level is and he can adjust it. And that turns out is not a bad thing. They to have do. been on the market a long time. I can right. remember back in around 2000, actually it was 2001 because AHA after 2001, and nobody was there because uh, it was empty because 9-11 had just happened and everybody was canceling flights. So there was the company that made the first um, at-home monitors, but there was such a pushback to do at-home cumulative monitoring. And they had all these stupid reasons for why it couldn't be done at home. I'm like, the diabetics have been doing this for years. I think we got this down. So I, I think they've become more readily available over the past 20 years, and right. it's a good idea to have them at home. Right. Um, so Rebecca had a question, um, and this is a tough one. Recently, she's running into is issues getting Ticacin from Pfizer due to back orders, and now she's been taking Dofetilide. Um, how do you know if it's safe and effective? Have we had any problems with Dofetilide? And um, I have a call scheduled with somebody from Pfizer on uh, the Norpace issue next week, I think. Um, and I can bring up the Ticacin issue as well. But yeah, that, I mean, they got to watch the EKG and look for the, the QT interval and stuff like that. And what it, did she say what the problem is? She just wants to, have to know how to ensure that it's safe and effective. Well, the effective part will be noticed if you start to have right. arrhythmias again, right. then we're going right. to have a problem. Um, so maybe a monitor while you're changing from one brand right. to another. Right, right, right. Yeah, just to make sure you're safe and provide you with a little peace of mind. So Mark, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this. Um, 
and I was so happy and then I was so disappointed years later. So Eagle Pharmacy created a partnership with uh, AstraZeneca right. to provide name brand Topral to all of us um, for a flat fee outside of insurance. Um, I was a participant in that program. Harry brought me over to their booth at a conference that you got to see this, look what they're doing. I'm like, wow. And we pumped it out and we let everybody know about it. And a lot of our patients benefited from it. And it was great. You know, no good deed goes unpunished. What we didn't realize was going on was, in my opinion, AstraZeneca was trying to put the product on the market to sell. So they wanted to prove that they had a lot of name brand utilization. So they provided this pathway to name brand to boost their sales, which we appreciate the deal because it worked for us, but then they sold the product to another company. And yet they're, yet they're still they canceled. Making, they're, they're, they're still making it, but they sold it for distribution to another company right, right. that could make a profit on it. So Eagle Pharmacy is out of the picture. Um, it was a great program. I would encourage them to bring it back at any time that they want. And uh, we will use name brand Topol again at a reasonable price. Um, if they want to charge us a little bit more, we're okay with that because we know the quality that we're getting. Where are they manufacturing and who can get, who, where can you get a generic equivalent of the name brand? Lynette, Lynette is really this, that's the authorized generic, Lynette, L-A-N-N-E-T-T. -T. Okay. Um, Lori asked, what's the issue with uh, Norpace? It's in shortage again. And um, we keep trying to tell them we're using the drug forecast for us when you're in production and they're not hearing us. Um, I will be discussing this with them again and get an idea. There, there are ways of getting the drug. If you go to your local pharmacy and they tell you they can't get it, give us a call. Um, we'll almost, you know, we, we'll have... A, a, a number for you to call within Pfizer where you can get utilization for at least a 30 day period directly from them to bridge you over. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have to use the, uh, you know, the short acting, which means you have to take it every eight hours and try not to forget every eight hours. Lisa, um, Lisa, yes, that's another company that is making drugs in short supply. Oh, yes, yes. Civica Rx. And maybe what we maybe we should get in touch with them and see if they would take this on, because this isn't the first time. But Pfizer would have, you know, I think at this point Pfizer has to and <laughs> Pfizer, let's talk about this, people. Let's get this done. You know, we can't be keep, keep, you can't keep leaving us in the in a lurch. No. And patients need this. So either you need to allow another manufacturer to make a, an equivalent and make it available um, through that, or you got to keep up with production. And some way we need to come up with an answer. I would, the last time we had a big, big shortage, I was trying to speak with Sanofi, who has the license in Europe for, um, what do they call it over there? Um, I can't think of the name over there. Um, it's, it's, it's an odd sounding name. Um, Rhythmidol? No, yes? Yeah, mm -hmm. Rhythmidol, I think is the name in Europe that Dicepiramide is sold under or Norpacin controlled release. So we tried to talk to them about getting some capsules over here, but there was a couple of hurdles that we would have to go through. They were willing to if the market was big enough, but I don't think that it is. And I think that they thought well, Pfizer fixed it. So I have to just go rekindle that whole conversation again. So um, yeah, Norpace is a great drug for a lot of people. And uh, it's just so annoying that it keeps going into shortage. So there might be some other options in the future. Um, and maybe that's what Pfizer needs to understand that we like this drug, it works for a lot of people, but Mavic Hampton is showing promise in the right. same patient population. So maybe you'll have another option soon. Um, somebody, when we first started this call or this chat, put Mavic Hampton, question mark, question mark. Not every conversation is about Mavic Hampton. Mavic Hampton is not the end all be all of all things HCM. It may be a wonderful treatment option for a subsection of the population, but it's not going to be, you know, this panacea that's gonna fix all of our problems. So, Maybe fix some. And we still need to be enthusiastic about it. Any other questions before we let Dr. Lever go for the day? And I have some announcements. 
we'll give you another couple seconds. So as I'm gonna ramble on here for a second, those of you who joined us last week, um, we're a part of the HCM Big Hearted Tour. Um, and we met with uh, our team at Cleveland Clinic. Nick Smidera showed us pictures of a live myectomy, which was really cool. Um, I'm not sure everybody was like as enthralled as I, but I'm fascinated by cardiac surgery. So that was pretty cool. Um, so you can watch that on our YouTube channel coming up soon if you miss the live event. I wanna talk about a couple of live events that we have coming up on October. I actually have a very busy week next week. October 8th, we're doing our uh, big hearted tour with NYU in New York City. Um, obviously, we'll all be virtual, but our team at NYU will be there. And on Saturday the 10th, we have our UCSF meeting. So those West Coasters um, come join us early in the morning on Saturday. It'll be mid Saturday for us. Um, and then we have on uh, the 9th, uh, I have the podcast like ooh, Sorry, I just whacked my microphone. Uh, we have the podcast coming back up with Dr. Martin Marin. And then in another two weeks after that, we'll be back with Dr. Lever. And um, I'm on, this is not officially on the calendar yet, but it's going to be soon. I want you to mark your calendars for October 12th. For those of you who have signed up to participate in our legislative subcommittee um, work coming up, uh, and we've said, you know, standby training will, you know, presume will we'll hopefully get done by the end of the year and then we'll deploy everything for 2021. We want to, um, we actually invited the family of Elizabeth T. McNamee, um, because that is who our legislative subcommittee is named after, to hear a presentation from the legislative subcommittee on what we've created over the past year and what our plans are for deployment. And then it dawned on me. If you want to be a volunteer and participate in the legislative subcommittee and get trained and and start working with us on these endeavors, um, why not just tell everybody at once what we built, how we built it, and what we're hoping for in the future? So we're going to put on a webinar on October 12th, and we're going to go over the entire history of how we came up with these uh, initiatives and what our hopes are and how you guys can all get involved. So mark your calendar for uh, the evening of the 12th. That's, I think that's gonna be at like 6.37 o'clock. So we'll do that. And I will get the information on Ballisher on the website or on the Facebook page here so you can contact them if you're interested. I will mention that there is no uh, reciprocal arrangement with any of the companies that Dr. Lever spoke of positively or negatively or this particular pharmacy. If you know a pharmacy that's doing batch testing for quality assurance, please let us know. We want to get that information out there. We think it's important for people to know. Okay. Any other comments, Dr. Lever? Nope. I don't think so. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Come and join us again on a future broadcast and stay safe and uh, take care of each other.